A powerful new COVID-19 vaccine from Novavax uses a different approach from previous vaccines and has been found to work well in more than 90% of tested individuals. These results are paving the way for it to be available later this year in the U.S. and elsewhere. The Novavax vaccine uses purified pieces of the coronavirus to spur an immune response in the body. Here are the details. Reuters reports that Novavax Incorporated said on Monday, June 14th, that its new COVID-19 vaccine was more than 90% effective against a variety of coronavirus variants. The company says its vaccine is most effective against the original coronavirus strain, as well as the alpha strain that was first detected in the UK. The vaccine is a more conventional type of mixture than those currently available. Novavax does not use mRNA, unlike mRNA vaccines like that of Pfizer and Moderna, which contain a piece of genetic code called RNA that prompts the body to create an immune response against the virus. Novavax differs from this in that it uses the traditional approach of injecting purified pieces of the virus to spur an immune response more directly. It contains an actual version of the virus's spike protein that has been treated so it cannot cause disease, but can still trigger the immune system. The body can then make antibodies against the spike proteins that cover the coronavirus and which enable the virus to penetrate human cell membranes. The Novavax vaccine showed successful results after its Phase 3 clinical trial, which tested more than 30,000 volunteers in the U.S. and Mexico. This puts Novavax on track to have its two-dose vaccine approved in the U.S. and elsewhere in the third quarter of 2021. The U.S. looks set to have a third COVID vaccine approved by the government and ready to be distributed within the month. But this vaccine works differently than the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines that are already being used in America and is effective with only a single dose. Here is what you need to know. Johnson & Johnson's COVID vaccine uses a genetically modified common cold virus, adenovirus 26, altered with blueprints for the coronavirus's spike protein. This same approach is used by the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine. The coronavirus's outer coating is covered in spike proteins, which gives the virus its crown-like appearance. The spike protein possesses receptor-binding domains, or RBDs, that the virus uses to pry open receptors before penetrating the cellular membrane. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine carries genetic material from the code for the spike protein that the coronavirus uses to enter a human cell. The spike protein gene is cut from the coronavirus and inserted into a vector, a virus that is weakened so that it cannot replicate inside the human body after injection. The EU this summer approved Johnson & Johnson's Ebola vaccine, which uses the same technology. The adenovirus vector also does not alter the human genome itself, as it does not carry the enzymes needed to edit DNA. Once the vector delivers its genetic payload to a cell, it causes the cell to produce spike proteins. These spike proteins are harmless on their own, but they should trigger the body to mount an immune response. This response produces antibodies and memory cells that will recognize SARS-CoV-2, the actual virus that causes COVID-19. While Johnson & Johnson's coronavirus vaccine uses the same adenovirus mechanism as the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine, there are two key differences. First, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine only requires one dose. The Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine requires a second dose given 4 to 12 weeks after the first. Second, the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine was 90% effective in preventing COVID-19 in clinical trials. Johnson & Johnson has yet to release full data from its trial, but according to its press release, the vaccine was 66% effective in preventing moderate disease 28 days after injection. However, the company said in a press release that it was 85% effective at preventing severe COVID and no one died or was hospitalized within 28 days of getting their shot. By comparison, Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines, which uses a relatively new technology that relies on a strand of genetic code called mRNA or messenger RNA, showed more than 90% efficacy from the phase 3 trials. What do Bahrain and the Indian Ocean island nation of Seychelles have in common? According to the Wall Street Journal, they have both relied predominantly on the China-produced Sinopharm COVID-19 vaccine and both have also experienced recent spikes in infections, despite large percentages of their populations being fully vaccinated. The picture, though, is a bit more complicated than it seems. Here's what you need to know. Doubts have arisen around the efficacy of China's Sinopharm vaccine after Bahrain began recommending over 50s with comorbidities get a booster of Pfizer-BioNTech six months after their second Sinopharm shot, according to the Wall Street Journal. The Sinopharm vaccine works by teaching our immune systems how to attack the coronavirus using inactivated viruses which can't replicate, according to the New York Times. 
Once injected into a patient, inactivated virus particles are swallowed by antigen-presenting cells that break them up and present fragments of them on their surfaces. From there, helper T-cells can attach to the fragments and send signals to activate other parts of the immune system, including B-cells and cytotoxic T-cells, according to Encyclopedia Britannica. Cytotoxic T-cells attach to infected cells and subsequently program them to die, according to the journal Immunobiology. B-cells create antibodies that attach to viruses to prevent them from invading cells, according to the New York Times. The idea behind the Sinopharm vaccine is that the body's immune system remembers this response using memory B cells. It is then ready to help reproduce the same specific antibodies if it comes into contact with a functioning coronavirus, according to the New York Times. The Washington Post reports Bahrain may have been prompted to recommend Pfizer-BioNTech booster shots after the country saw its worst wave of cases since the pandemic began in recent weeks. This came despite having vaccinated almost half of its population, mostly with the Sinopharm vaccine. Bahrain's Undersecretary of Health, however, pointed out to the Wall Street Journal that despite the recommendation, more than 90% of people hospitalized in this country's current COVID-19 wave had not been vaccinated and insisted that Sinopharm offered a high degree of protection. In Seychelles, it is a similar story. Despite 63% of its population being fully vaccinated and 57% of those receiving Sinopharm doses, in May, average cases rose to 400 new cases daily, up from around 50 in April, according to the BBC. However, similar to Bahrain, of those who required admission to a hospital, 80% hadn't been vaccinated. The country's health commissioner, Jude Gedeon, underlined the meaning of that statistic in an interview with local newspaper Seychelles Nation, saying, All the approved vaccines are effective at preventing severe illness and death from COVID-19. We know from national experience and report that they are less effective at preventing transmission. So at least one of the effects we may be watching here is that the Sinopharm vaccine prevents serious illness developing, but doesn't prevent the coronavirus from spreading. However, there are still more explicit doubts expressed about the vaccine's efficacy. According to the BBC, the head of China's Center for Disease Control and Prevention, George Gao, appeared to address the issue when he said, We will solve the problem that current vaccines don't have very high protection rates, in a press conference reported by the Associated Press in April. What's more, according to the Wall Street Journal, an unpublished real-world study of Sinopharm in Serbia found that 29% of 150 participants had zero antibodies against the virus three months after they received the first two shots. Olhika Jerkovic Djokovic, the doctor who headed the study at the University of Belgrade, told the Wall Street Journal directly, The Sinopharm vaccine is not immunogenic enough, and it appears that its impact is especially low on elderly recipients. For its part, the WHO's assessment of the vaccine based on multi-country trial data from tens of thousands of people, was that it was 79% effective against symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection 14 or more days after the second dose, and vaccine efficacy against hospitalization was 79%. However, that briefing partially acknowledged one widespread claim against Sinopharm, that not enough trial data has been released about it, saying that safety data was limited for people above 60 years of age. The primary method through which COVID-19 is spreading is being contested by scientists. Here's what you need to know. Airborne transmission of COVID-19 is not simply possible. There is consistent, strong evidence that this is the dominant method by which it spreads, according to a new review article published in the Lancet Medical Journal. The authors of the review suggest that an overemphasis on spread through large respiratory droplets at close range could mean public health policies have been misdirected. In scientific briefings made available on its website, the WHO defines aerosols as being less than 5 micrometers in diameter and respiratory droplets as being greater than 5 micrometers in diameter. However, The Lancet states that droplets with diameters of up to 100 micrometers may be able to spread the virus through the air. Foremost among its justifications for this claim is the role of superspreader events in spreading COVID-19. These events, whereby a large number of people in the same area are infected with the virus, cannot be explained by close-range respiratory droplets or fomites, the review says. Further evidence in the same direction comes from observations of transmission between people in adjacent rooms and quarantine hotels, but never in each other's presence. This is not the first time the WHO's emphasis on short-range respiratory droplet and fomite transmission has been questioned. In February, science journal Nature suggested that investing in costly disinfection efforts could have meant underinvesting in more effective ventilation systems. 
The WHO itself remains reticent about drawing firm conclusions on the airborne versus short-range respiratory droplet debate, with the report it commissioned concluding that the lack of recoverable viral culture samples of the virus prevents us from doing so. Coronavirus vaccines are coming as soon as the end of 2020 for some people. When should you expect to get yours? Here is what we know so far. According to a Reuters analysis, up to 40 million doses of coronavirus vaccines are expected to be available in the U.S. by the end of 2020. 25 million of these will come from Pfizer-BioNTech and 12.5 million from Moderna. This assumes Moderna's vaccine is authorized early in the second half of December and Pfizer follows through on its production plans. As both vaccines require two doses, this would only be enough to inoculate 20 million people, though not all these doses will be immediately available. The first batch will cover 3.2 2 million people. The CDC then expects about 5 million to 10 million doses to be shipped per week in the first weeks of the vaccine distribution effort. While doses will be allocated by the federal government based on state populations, the states are tasked with implementing their own vaccine distribution plans, though these must follow general guidance from the CDC's interim playbook for COVID-19. According to the CDC, the recommended first phase of the distribution plan, called 1A, will give priority to 21 million healthcare workers and 3 million adults in long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes, who are particularly vulnerable. The next part of the distribution phase, 1B, will prioritize other essential workers, including police, firefighters, and food and agriculture workers. 1C will prioritize adults older than 65 and those with high-risk medical conditions that leave them at increased risk of serious complications from COVID. Phase 2 comes into effect when a larger number of doses are available. It will focus on critical populations not covered by Phase 1. This includes people who work in schools, transportation, housing facilities like nursing homes, and other places with high concentrations of people. Phase 3 comes into effect when there is sufficient supply of vaccine doses for the entire population. It focuses on young adults and children in an attempt to stop super-spreading events and other essential workers who had not been previously vaccinated. Phase 4 then includes everyone else. The U.S. government has made deals for 100 million doses of Pfizer's vaccine for $1.95 billion U.S. dollars and 100 million of Moderna's for $1.5 billion, with options to buy more. Reuters reports that the government expects vaccines to be free for most Americans. Even as a deadly second wave of COVID-19 ravages India, doctors are now reporting a rash of cases involving a rare fungal infection, also called the black fungus, among recovering and recovered COVID-19 patients. The infection has a very high mortality rate, and treatment often involves the removal of an eye. Here are the details. The BBC reports that surgeons in India are reporting a sharp increase in the number of mucormycosis cases in patients who survived COVID-19. Mucormycosis is a rare fungal infection that is caused by exposure to mucor mold, which is commonly found in soil, plants, and even in the mucus of healthy people. It affects the sinuses, the brain, and the lungs, and can be life-threatening in diabetics or people with weakened immune systems. The infection has a frightening mortality rate of 50% and often requires the removal of an eye or sinus tissues. Diabetics who survived coronavirus are especially at risk. Some doctors believe that's because diabetes lowers the body's immune defenses, then coronavirus exacerbates the problem, and then steroids, which help fight coronavirus, acts like fuel to the fire. Steroids reduce inflammation in the lungs for COVID-19 and limit the damage, but they also reduce immunity in both diabetic and non-diabetic COVID-19 patients. It is thought that this drop in immunity could be triggering India's spike in mucormycosis cases. Mumbai's busy Scion Hospital has reported 24 cases of the fungal infection in the past two months, up from six cases a year. 11 of them had to lose an eye, and 6 of them died. Most of the patients are middle-aged diabetics who were struck down by the fungus two weeks after recovering from COVID-19. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.